Good morning, good morning, good morning, and get ready, get ready, get ready. Welcome to the nation, Yana Nation. This is the place where empowering the special needs community is the mission, and we are mission driven. This is the show where we educate, advocate, elevate, and celebrate the special needs community as a whole. As I mentioned every week, we're the only radio program in the entire South that is exclusively here for the special needs community. So go ahead and lock us in for the next 30 minutes, wherever you are and however you are listening. We're represented on all national uh, podcast platforms and right here at Love 860 WAEC. My name is Rick Knight and I am your able-bodied host here at Love WAEC uh, in Atlanta. Continue to uh, go to our Facebook page, like us there. Your feedback is always welcome. If you care to weigh in on the show today, the number here is area code 355-404-355-8699. And if you're outside the area, the number is 866-923-2860. This is the show where we do not aim to fit in, but we do aim to fit out, so stand out. I want to invite you all to visit our website, yananation.com, and uh, click on the uh, podcast with the experts. Uh, you can hear many of our shows there. I encourage you all to do that. Start taking advantage of that resource. Well, we are halfway through the month of April, and this month is Zooming. Uh, we um, are, you know, rounding the corner in the uh, coming out of the pandemic fog. Many organizations are trying to rebuild, and many organizations, especially ones that serve special needs communities, rely on giving and uh, philanthropy. Now, there's a couple of scriptures uh, that, that uh, remind me uh, of the importance of charity and philanthropy. And one of my favorites comes out of Isaiah 58, 10. Uh, and it reads, uh, feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. So, that along with one of my favorite quotes, uh, you have not lived today until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. And that was from John Bunyan. Um, you know, from the 60s until now, nonprofit organizations and volunteer groups have played a major uh, advocacy role. So we're going to be talking about uh, philanthropy and the importance of that in the special needs uh, community. And we have a humdinger of a guest, a Jedi, a true servant leader uh, that is joining us today, and I am so excited about that. We've got Dr. Stephen Shire. Dr. Shire, welcome to the nation. Thank you for having me. It is such an honor, Rick, and God bless everyone that's listening today. All right. Now, I don't know if, if uh, you want to tell the folks a little bit about yourself or if you want me to uh, do it, uh, and uh, I, I know you, you would probably... Well, you know you better than me, <laughs> but uh, I, I think the people need to know exactly who uh, who they're speaking with. Oh, wow. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, um, my family are Iraqi Christian immigrants. Uh, my dad immigrated to the United States in 1966. Uh, he got a job the first day he started. He got here and he met my mother here. Um, and he was working four jobs while, you know, starting a family. We come from very humble beginnings, but we're rich in family, rich in spirit, rich where mattered. My father ultimately started a medical lab um, and sold it in 1996. He was retired for about five weeks. And my mother basically kicked him out of the house, said, you need to go do something. So he started a company called j and Medical in 1996. At that time, I was graduating medical school from Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. I spent a couple of years working with him there. And then I went on to do a family practice residency. Um, and I did about 100 deliveries of babies during my journey, uh, which was very exciting. My family started a company called j and and uh, JB is a family owned, privately held company based in Wixom, Michigan. Today, we have 18 different uh, business lines uh, medical distribution, specialty distribution. Most people know us as one of the largest third party billers of consumable medical products to the homes in the United States. Uh, we reach over 200 million covered lives via insurance contracts. We have a telemedicine telehealth company, we do virtual visits around the world. Um, it is very much a family business. I get fired quite regularly, Rick, but fortunately I have three grandchildren uh, for, uh, for my mother. My father passed away 
in um, uh, in November of last year. And then I had started a family office in 2017 uh, called the Cod Holdings. Um, the Acadian Empire was the first empire in Mesopotamia. We're Iraqi Christians. And the Acadians were the great connectors of their time. And so I used that as my name for my family office. Uh, and our mantra is people, purpose, pay it forward. And we started to invest in um, healthcare entities in which um, we could leverage JB's global distribution channels. Um, JB is a platform of purpose, platform of possibilities. And again, today we're in 48 states, we're in 28 countries. Uh, so we have the honor and privilege of providing care to people literally around the globe. Wow, that is an awful lot. And and you know, I love the I love the alliterative uh, people purpose pay it forward. Um, I mean that 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 mindset is just awful, and it fits perfectly into what we're going to be talking about uh, today. And uh, we sort of cross paths uh, with the the. Uh, BDI uh, being the common denominator. So we, I want to talk about uh, giving the what you see the importance of philanthropy. You know, my own per, you know personal belief is that you know phila philanthropy gives a voice to the voiceless. It uh, you know it it definitely allows uh, you know it gives people the opportunity to improve their lives. But let me just ask this: um, you know, what are some of the initiatives that you have on the philanthropic uh, when you are paying it forward, so to speak, what, what are some of the initiatives that you've either started or that you are passionate about or that you are involved in? So there's there's numerous ones. One of the things that my father passionately believed in is that if people could achieve their health potential, they could achieve their human potential. And so my father passionately believed that we believe healthcare is a right. It's not a privilege. And so some of the initiatives um, that we've done, uh, we provide access to healthcare around the globe using telemedicine and an innovative business model. So instead of focusing on building infrastructure in places where you don't have the medical professionals around to help, we use we leverage technology and we provide access to care. So for example, in Pakistan, uh, we were able to take care of over a, mo a million mothers and children that never had access to healthcare using telemedicine and an innovative business model. And let me tell you something, Rick, not only did we provide access to care in the most remote, rural, undeveloped areas around the world, um, but we were able to provide some dignity, some hope, okay? And in this crazy world that's, you know, bitterly divided, the temperatures are high, you know, just caring, just caring, just loving has helped you know, cross the bridges of the socioeconomic divide, the religious divide, the cultural divide. And, and so those, I think there's a lot of opportunities like that. And I want to make a, make a distinction here. There's a big difference between charity and philanthropy. You know, charity is, you know, we see it as you provide, you know, resources. It's more rescue, relief, short term. Yeah. Philanthropy is you invest strategically and intentionally in something that can be, you know, build something greater, something long-term, it's very strategic. And so um, with, you mentioned BDI, and with other collaborations, we are looking to build things that will last beyond our lifetime. My father died in November. And one of the things we always used to talk about, there's a lot of legends in the cemetery. There are very few legacies. There are very few legacies. And so, um, you know, our goal is to build things that are sustainable, that's scalable. Now, you know, we truly believe philanthropy, you could be the catalytic capital. You could be the initial capital that comes in where people say, okay, they're in. And they're not just in with money. They're in with their time. They're in with their, their energy. They're in with their love. They're in with their name. You know what I mean? And that to me, exactly what you mean. that's a magnet. That's a well, magnet for other people to come in and say, hey, he's in, I'm in, or she's yeah. in, I'm in. Dr. Shah, you, you were really speaking my language earlier when you were talking about uh, rural areas and service and resource deficits, not only in places like Pakistan, but places like right here in the United States where there are huge resource uh, 
and service deficits in rural areas. And then when you look at the big picture, the, the big fabric of America, most of it is, is, is made up of, of small rural communities. And you, you start talking about telemedicine, you know, and, and here in Georgia, unfortunately, Georgia is 40, is, is maybe 48 out of 50 states as far as uh, providing uh, resources uh, and benefits to the special needs community. So my question, when you, when you look at what you guys did, which is amazing in Pakistan, just turning the lens a little bit and looking at what is, what uh, the rural areas here in the United States, do you, do you follow that same business model here in the United States? Absolutely. So let me give you a couple of real life examples. Okay. So um, now this is an urban area, not rural, but, but um, in Watts, in a very urban area in Los Angeles, 40% of the population did not see a primary care physician. So we put telemedicine um, solutions in the churches, in the community centers. Um, and so, and then National University, a nursing school would provide the, the healthcare professional virtually. Uh, and um, and, and the program was wildly successful because, you know, many people, you know, we take for granted certain things. We take for granted transportation. We take for granted that people can take, take a day off work to go see. And those issues are exacerbated in rural areas. And so I think there's an opportunity uh, for what I call venture philanthropy, innovative approach to, to, um, to your philanthropy where, you know, particularly in rural areas where they don't have the resources that you do in the urban areas, we can take some of these technologies and expand access. And again, it's not just, it's not just, you know, the technology, it's not just providing access to the resources. I think there's something in our society, people got to know you care. People got to know that you feel them, that you understand. That's what's missing today. There's so many, you know, you know, people don't, they're, you know, people don't, they talk, but they don't listen. They don't understand. And I think, you know, there's ways to leverage technology and innovative delivery models where not only can we provide more access, but I think we can provide more understanding and build bridges that are missing today. That is very well said. We're coming up against a break here uh, in a couple of minutes uh, or in one minute. Uh, but on the other side of the break, this is one of the things that I want to talk because I love this conversation. I want to I want to talk about what your view is, and you can kind of think about this going into the break. The the socioeconomic impact to uh, philanthropy, because you said you know philanthropy versus charity, you know that legacy building piece is is uh, something I think people kind of overlook. Because you know somebody gives you know five bucks or puts ten bucks in in this pot or in this tray, and they they think that you know which is great, but it's not what we're talking about. So uh, we're going into break right here. On the other side, we're going to talk about the the socioeconomic impact of philanthropy, and uh, some of those uh, things that impact society in that way. So stay tuned. Right. Okay, Dr. Shaw, one, one, one thing uh, that I did want to mention, uh, when you were giving your, uh, your brief bio, you were a bit modest in as much as you, you had a, 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 a very impactful uh, involvement with uh, the Pope, with the Vatican. Is that right? Uh, yes, thank you. So uh, in 2018, my wife and I and our, our two children and one in utero had the honor and privilege of meeting Pope Francis at the Vatican. Uh, we're very involved and active and supportive with the Cura Foundation, uh, which works very closely with the Vatican. Um, actually, just participated in a uh, just uh, participated in. Um, there's a virtual event that's going on May 6th through 8th. Uh, the Holy Father Pope Francis will be participating, and then we're actively involved. And some of their global health initiatives to provide innovations uh, globally. Um, the Catholic Church certainly has its challenges, just like every other institution these days, but nobody houses, clothes, feeds, educates, or provides more health care globally than the Catholic Church. And so we're trying to find ways to leverage those channels to, to advance 
uh, innovations around global health. And my wife and I are part of, I'll say, the catalytic efforts to advance that. That, that is, that is high-minded stuff right there. Uh, now, I want to I want to pivot to, I know your passion, uh, because I could hear it and see it, uh, was in, in healthcare and the importance and, and how many different uh, sectors it really can affect the quality of someone's life. But I want to ask this, do you see a direct correlation between uh, healthcare and people's ability uh, and the, their their economic uh, station in life. Uh, let me give an example. Um, and, and I know that you are familiar with disability communities because you work with BDI. So when when because the, the poverty level is is exponentially higher with uh, parents who have children with disabilities or, or some type of special need. As far as educating the the parents on what to do and how to do it and providing things. Everybody wants a, to get a, a cure for any of the disabilities and work towards that, work towards treatments and so forth. But on the other end, the economic end, do you see a socioeconomic tie there where the parents just don't know what to do or where to get information? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But you know, again, if you reach your health potential, you can reach your human potential. So. You know, when you have certain challenges, it's, it's much harder to be successful in life, right? And so I think this is where philanthropy um, can play a huge role. When you talk about impact, when you talk about impact, and you use some biblical script, uh, scriptures. So, you know, there was a parable in the Bible about the sower and the seeds. Yeah. And, you know, you know, depending on where you put the seeds, you can get exponential return, 30, 60, 100 fold. And so when you talk about making an impact, you know, I think there's so many causes around people with, with disabilities that really for fairly modest sums of money can make a difference in, in you know, helping build awareness campaigns, you know, and education and advocacy and research and helping just even with some of the therapy expenses, because some of these you know, are very costly. So when you talk about making an impact, when you talk about changing people's lives, I mean, there's so many opportunities. And, and you know, quite frankly, I mean, we all want to do things around the globe um, and, you know, do these, you know, it, but, but there's just right here at home, the need is so great. The need is so great. Now, the other thing about persons with disabilities, 80% of the persons with disabilities are in emerging developing markets around the world. So it is a global need. And I think, you know, one thing that we've learned from this pandemic is that we are all connected. If we're good in the United States, but they're not good in Africa or good in Europe or good in Asia, it's gonna affect us ultimately. So I think one of the lessons learned from the pandemic is we're all in this together. If I'm good and you're not good, that's not good. Exactly. You know, and people don't realize that uh, that in the United States, the largest minority group is the disability community. And then worldwide, the largest international or global uh, minority is the disability community. And, you know, there, there was an old saying, gosh, uh, you know, uh, that I heard years ago that you, it said something to the to the effect of if if America catches a cold, the world has the flu. And it seems like with this particular, in this particular area, the United States, who has really marginalized the disability community, if you look outside of the United States, it's, it's far worse in most uh, uh, developing or emerging economies. Because I, I looked at uh, Vietnam, I looked at uh, Ethiopia, uh, and I looked at Europe even, and it just seems as though there is just so many vacuums, uh, you know, or, or, or here's another way to look at it. So many opportunities to really impact the disability community worldwide in so many different areas, not just uh, throw, you know, again, you know, sending the check in and, and, and feeling good because you think this is going to help, help find a cure because there's some disabilities they actually 
get offended if you start talking about cure because there is no cure and they want to be accepted for who they are right now. So as we begin to wind down here, I wanted to ask this um, because you talked about uh, Pakistan as one of your, your global initiatives and just simple things, you know, like clean water is another thing that, that people take for advantage. But when you are looking uh, in places like Pakistan or in rural areas, what are what are some of the other other than like telehealth, which is awesome? And and they, I had the lady on the show that that created the bill for telehealth here in Georgia. What are some of the other service deficits or resource deficits that you see? So we're supporting a lot of different causes. Obviously, uh, the way we met is through BDI, and you know, veterans and persons with disabilities. You know, we had a mantra, and this totally from my father, called total health. And it's, it's the health of the patient, the health of the employee, the health of the community. And so the reason why we partnered with BDI is we wanted to create jobs and opportunities for persons with disabilities. And let me tell you, hope is the most powerful thing that you can, hope and love is the most powerful thing you can do. And so, so that was that, and, I, and that program is growing. We're big supporters of the Children's Trust Fund in Michigan, which helps neglected and abused mothers. Unfortunately, during COVID, um, with people being at home, a lot of those issues have been amplified. So that's been a big issue. I'm, um, I'm personally the chairman of the American Diabetes Association in Michigan. We, we take care of a huge population, one of the largest in the United States, uh, patients with diabetes. And unfortunately, minorities and underserved folks are disproportionately affected with diabetes and it, it's an, a runaway train. And um, so it's, it's one of those areas that we feel very passionately that, you know, that, you know, oftentimes the minorities and underserved areas get the short end of the stick. And so, you know, we're, we're a provider there, but you know, the best way, I mean, we have a whole list of things that we support, but the, the best thing for us, Gene B, we're just servant leaders. Gene yeah, B is a, yeah. Let me let me just as we wind down, I wanted to get this one, this question in because the, the mantra of this show is to um, educate, advocate, elevate, and celebrate the special needs community. But this is the one thing that this show also wants to do. We want to we want to answer in any way that we can this one question: What would happen to a child with a disability if something were to happen to the parent? And and looking at trying to ensure that this child is insulated enough with good information, good resources, so that they can enjoy the best quality of life, even in the absence of that parent. So when you're out there, even with BDI, do you see where the lack of planning or just the lack of information really causes some of these some of these families, some of these children to suffer. I know up in, in, in Michigan, you know, when uh, Aretha Franklin passed away, she had a, a child with special needs and didn't have a trust, didn't have, you know, and now nobody knows what's going to happen to him. So do you see that as an issue? Absolutely. And we see it every single day because we're on the front lines. We're taking care of a lot of these folks, providing products and services. And when their caregivers are no longer around, there, there needs to be better planning to help support folks through their journey in life. And, you know, my father, he passed away, he was 77. So, but I, it's amazing, Rick, how many people I met that told me their father passed away when they're 15, 20, you know, and, and, right. and what do you do? What do you do? You know, how do you provide resources and support? I think that's a massive issue. It's overlooked. And we really... This is, there needs to be you know much more education and awareness around that. I did want to throw in something though, and yes. this is one of my father's favorite quotes from Winston Churchill, and he says, "We we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give." And I just you know it's something. It's just it's every day. I remember my father. He lived it. He didn't say it. He lived it, and he breathed it. And that's something I challenge everyone today. It, well, it's not. It's how much you give and, and, you know, you know, and how many, how many folks we can, we can help on this journey. Well, on that note, we're going to have to end, Dr. Sai, this has been one of the most energetic and fulfilling 
uh, you know, uh, interviews that we've done. So you have delivered on our 100th show in full spades this morning. So uh, thank you very much and uh, continue uh, on this magnificent journey that you're going as far as uh, philanthropy goes. So thank you. God bless you. Thank you for having me on. It's such an honor. And My God pleasure. bless everyone. All right, as we wind down here, you know you get Rick's tips, so I'd like to hear it. Here it goes. Giving is a cornerstone to helping build organizations, whether it's a, to a church, your favorite charity, or a good cause. A gift to a qualified charitable organ, organization may entitle you to a charitable contribution deduction against your income tax if you itemize deductions. You must itemize in order to take a charitable deduction. So make sure that if you itemize your total deductions, uh, if they're greater than your standard deduction, they're not, stick with the standard deduction. We make a living uh, by what we get, what we get, but we make a life by what we give. If you change your financial thinking, you can change your financial future. 